so we've been looking at um, sanctification and we have understood that it's not just something that is theoretical we also have our role to play it's something very practical where we also have to cooperate and participate with the lord in making it happen so we we basically notice there are two aspects to this uh, sanctification so we see that at the time of salvation god does something inside of us uh, he 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 takes us from the dominion of darkness he has placed us in the kingdom of the sun and uh, now we become set apart so you see the entire human race is living over there under the dominion of darkness but this these people who reach out to him these people who trust him and you know say that we want to make you our lord those people he takes them and he sets them apart they are now set apart in a new kingdom they have been placed in a in, in an entirely different realm so they have been set apart and now god says regarding these people these people are now mine they are my own special people uh, so we see that in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 which talks about this initial aspect of sanctification because the word sanctification is basically meaning something which is set apart so initially in that moment of salvation god sets us apart for himself first peter 2:9 what you what you are a chosen generation a royal priest priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so the description given over here about these people that god has set apart for himself he calls them chosen generation god has chosen them to be removed from the dominion of darkness and brought into his kingdom they are own, his own special people it says uh, so those are the descriptions which are given to talk about a people who have now been set apart to be entirely his belonging to him no longer under the control of satan but now belonging entirely to him and set apart for him so obviously the other aspect of sanctification will now be if we are a set apart people then we should be behaving like as if we have been set apart we must be acting according to this new status so in our uh, lifestyle are we set apart for god or are we living in the same way that the rest of the world is living if we are living in the same way that the rest of the world is living then in you know in in practical reality we are not living set apart lives so even though status wise we have been set apart and declared to be his in practice we are not um, you know uh, following that so that should not be the case right so which is why it says in ephesians 4:1 what does it say in ephesians 4:1 Okay, so uh, Paul says over here, "I urge you." You know, strong words that he uses. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. You have been called to live to be a set apart people, a chosen generation. So live in a way that is worthy of this high calling that you have received. Is what you know he says over here. And in uh, in you know, you know with what with. what authority does he say it he says as a prisoner of the lord i urge you to do this so he says i was willing to go to the extent of becoming a prisoner so that i could live a set apart life that is my level of commitment so because i am i'm also practicing what i'm preaching i'm telling you people you also be like me you know live a life that is worthy of the calling that you have received so um we have been set apart by god for himself at the moment of salvation so sanctification began with that but now we also need to behave like uh, set apart people in our actions and live a life that is worthy of this calling that we have been called to so just to look at some you know basic uh, features of sanctification some basic facts and truths about sanctification sanctification is possible only by god's help 
you know with with god's help it cannot be done on our own uh, it's a supernatural work that god does in us uh, first thessalonians 5 23 23 it says it you know it, it starts off by saying may god himself the god of peace may he sanctify you through and through so he is the one who will keep your spirit soul and body blameless but then what do we need to do from our side Galatians five sixteen. Galatians five sixteen. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes. So, people who choose to walk by the spirit, who are following the leading of the spirit. they are the ones that you know god will be able to sanctify through and through they are the ones who will be kept blameless in their spirit soul and body so god will do that but he can only do it for people who have made a choice to walk by the spirit rather than walking according to the desires of the flesh so uh, it's a supernatural work god is more than ready to do it but we need to walk by the spirit walk Uh, and and be led by the holy spirit listen to what he is saying be guided by him be warned by him when he corrects us of some sin we choose to submit and say okay lord i will no longer do that so we choose to walk by the spirit and as we do that he will sanctify us he will start making us more more and more like christ so it is a it is a supernatural work that god does in us if we choose to you know cooperate with him and it's also a continual process you know you know it's not something which happens in just one day you know one day when you're in, you know in the presence of the lord you may have a great encounter you may feel god's presence extremely powerfully you know you you may even have a vision of, of the lord himself you know and he may speak things to you so you may go through that beautiful experience which causes you to you know which encourages you to walk in greater holiness but you can't just depend on that one experience that one experience alone will not make you perfect it's an ongoing continual process which goes on throughout your entire life which is what philippians 16 says uh, philippians 16 yes so this process of uh, you know him completing it it will go on until the day of jesus christ on the day of jesus christ when he comes you know uh, comes back during his second coming on that day we will be rewarded but up to that time the process continues on and on okay so uh, it's a continuous process it's an ongoing process and the aim of sanctification the chief main goal of sanctification is that we should become like christ so that would be romans 8:29 yes so um so we could say that sanctification has got three stages uh at the moment of salvation uh he he turns us into a new creation which now has a desire to live like god because now he has you know initiated the process of of, of us becoming like jesus in that moment that moment onwards from that moment of regeneration when we become a new creation we have new desires we have a new passion uh our loyalties are now new and different so everything changes in that moment of salvation uh which is what we see in first john 3 verse 9 first john 39 so once that person is made into a new creation they now have new desires 
no longer do they want to continue living in sin rather they they want to be loyal to god they want to be clean they want to feel clean uh, so there are new desires and passions which are created inside them why does all of this happen because now the holy spirit has birthed given birth to that person as a new creation so in in a sense it says you know god's seed is now in them uh, if we were to use modern uh, wording we would say that the dna of god is now inside that person because the holy spirit has given birth to that new creation so in in a, in in a sense uh, god's dna is god's seed is now inside that person you know if if you have a uh, using a human example if a person has a deep love let us say for music you know and uh, that little kid that he has you know a 3 year old 4 year old that child can't even walk properly talk properly but the try uh, that kid tries to take the guitar and start playing it because this is deep love for music which is birthed in that child why because that the father's dna has been passed on to the child so we have these uh, kids who are so musically inclined why because that dna of the parent has been passed on to the child and they literally have it inside them it drives them to start playing music even before they are old enough to hold the instruments in their hands you know it's it's they they're driven to do that because that their dna is driving them to be like that and that is what is supposed to happen with us we literally have god's seed inside us which drives us to want to be holy it makes us long to be loyal to him it makes us want to please him and no longer are we having that same passion that we had earlier for sinful things okay so that that is what happens for us uh, and that is how sanctification begins you know with god's seed being inside us which makes us long for new things which we never longed for earlier and of course uh you know the process then goes on you know for the for the for the rest of our days it continues to increase sanctification as time goes by is supposed to go on increasing and we have a couple of verses which talk about that uh, hebrews 12 verse 1 hebrews 12 verse 1 therefore we also since we are surrounded by a great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us okay, so there are two things which are mentioned over here first it says throw off everything that is holding you back everything that is you know uh, restricting you from having the sanctified holy life throw it off get rid of it you know if it's the wrong company wrong kind of friends you know uh, get rid of them uh, if it is uh, certain things that you are uh, attracted to and you're wasting your time on those things get rid of those things so it says uh, throw off everything that is hindering you and it especially says that sin which so easily entangles for different people it's different things you know uh, some may be drawn by one particular sin but for another person uh, you know their temptation area of temptation may be something else so for most people there are this one or two things which are a real area of weakness they they very easily fall into sin so for them it is that particular sin which is entangling them which is ensnaring them placing them in a trap so he, he, you know it says over here throw off all the things which are you know uh, slowing you down and especially throw off those those particular sins which always you know end up trapping you get rid of those things first uh, because then you will be able to run with perseverance um, and then other verse which talks about something similar uh, second corinthians 3:18 So you see, we are supposed to be transformed into uh, Jesus' image with ever increasing glory, and that's only going to happen for people who are, you know, throwing off everything which hinders. These are the people who are throwing off the sins which are especially trapping them, and because they are doing this on a daily basis, because they are running with with perseverance, what happens to them? They start being transformed into Jesus' image. with ever increasing glory 
uh, it cannot happen for people who are not cooperating with the Lord. Uh, and uh, so sanctification is supposed to continue. It's supposed to increase as you go through life. And finally, when will it, the sanctification process be complete? When the Lord returns at his second coming. Um, because at his second coming, not only are you sanctified in your spirit, uh, not only are you sanctified in your thinking, you actually, even your physical body will be sanctified at that time. You know, it's quite a um, quite an interesting thought. Uh, you know, if let's first actually look at Romans 7, 5, which talks about, you know, sin in the flesh. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 5. Yeah, that would be our NIV. Um, oh, you know, NKJV kind of brings it out more literally, uh, where it says, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So it's literally talking about the physical members of the body, you know, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears. Uh, so the sin was active in our human flesh. So even the human flesh, the human body is unsanctified in that sense. You know, so um, when Jesus Christ comes back and, uh, you know, our bodies are resurrected, at that time, not only are we sanctified in spirit and in mind, we, in fact, even our physical body itself will be sanctified and turned into a glorious resurrected body. So in God's eyes, even the human container that you're living in, that also has got value. Even that will be sanctified one day, is what it says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Yeah, okay. So it says over here, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Even this lowly body, you know, which is so easily um, tempted by uh, sinful desires, even that will be turned into a glorious body. Even the physical body will be sanctified on that final day you know, when the Lord returns. So it's going to be a complete sanctification. And that process first began when we were birthed as a new creation and God put his DNA inside us so that we would be driven. We would have the same passions that he has. We would long to be like him. We would want to uh, uh, you know, uh, do the things that he does. So uh, it begins with that. And it finally ends with even the physical body being sanctified by the Lord. Because that is his dream for us. That is what he actually longs for us. And because God has gone to great cost to make this possible, because, you know, he, ha he had to sacrifice his son so that we can have this privilege, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to do Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. If someone could read out. Philippians, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Yeah. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the word, word but uh, the spirit who is from God that we might, uh, might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Are These, you sure? Philippians 2, 12 and 13, unless I have written the wrong reference. It says here, continue Therefore, to yeah. work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so because of uh, what God has done for us, now it is our duty to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That word which is used over there, work out, that's the Greek word. Oh, I'm sure I destroyed the poor word. Okay, continue to 
Kater Gazamoy, your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation. That word literally means to produce something, to create something. So over here it is saying, please continue to produce your salvation. What does that mean? It's saying produce fruits of salvation. You were saved for a purpose so that you can live in a different way. So now in your, on, your, on a daily basis, even as you're living, kindly work out, kindly produce, kindly create the fruits of salvation. So when people look at us, they should say, oh, this person is saved because the fruit which is coming out of their life, it's the fruits of salvation that I see. So in that sense, when it says work out, that word is literally talking about creating something, producing something. What are you supposed to produce? You're supposed to produce the fruits of salvation on a daily basis. So we, we are actively supposed to do that. And it says, continue to you know produce the fruits of salvation. How? With what kind of an attitude? With fear and trembling is how you're supposed to do it. Now, what on earth does that mean? Uh, you know, um, so over here, it's not talking about doing good works to earn salvation. Salvation has already been given to us. Here it is talking about how now that we have received the salvation, let us start producing fruits which are in line with salvation. Yeah, go ahead. That is when the physical body also will be sanctified when we are... Uh, okay, the question asked was, over here was, uh, when will the sanctification process be completed? Yeah, it would be completed at that time where, uh, when uh, even the physical body also will be sanctified. As for us uh, becoming like Jesus Christ, it says that when we see him, we will be like him. So I guess that would be uh, depending on what comes first. If Jesus Christ comes down now while we are still alive, then yes, we would become like him now itself. On the other hand, if we die physically first before the coming, then um, after death we will be sanctified. So we have been justified. We have been declared perfectly righteous. When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Yes. But when we, when we look at our attitudes and our behavior, we don't see that work working out in practice. Why? Because status-wise, he's given it to us. But when it comes to a practical reality, we have to start living like that. And I had given this example once. I remember mentioning it over here in this class, where I'm pretty sure it was in this class, where I talked about a child with learning disabilities. The child can know, doesn't have the ability to, to ever get good marks. And so uh, the teacher gives that child 100 on 100. At the beginning of the year itself, the child has already been given 100 on 100. So the end of the year, when the marks card is given, the child will be receiving 100 on 100. It's already been given, already been granted. Now the child has the freedom to start attaining towards that. Whatever the child can do from his side, he puts in the effort, starts working towards it. Why? Not because he's striving to get that 100 on 100, but because it's been freely given, now he wants to show that, yes, this is something that I want to you know, reach towards. So rather than being lazy and sitting back and saying, ah, I've anyway got the 100 on 100. Now, you know, let me just you know, uh, play around and do nothing. No, it will not be, that's not, the, that's not the intention with which the teacher gave the 100 on 100. The teacher gave so that the child will no longer feel pressurized, will no longer feel under condemnation, will no longer feel under the judgment of you know receiving a failed card at the end of the year. All that has been removed, wiped out. The child has technically been justified. But on a daily basis, does the child appreciate what has been done for him? Does he start reaching towards that thing which the teacher has so lovingly done for him? Or does he sit back in laziness? So it says in, a, in, a, in the Ephesians thing, you know, live in a way which is worthy of the calling. You've already been justified. So therefore choose to be sanctified, which is why Hebrews 4, uh, 10, 4 was it? 10, Hebrews 10, 14, I think, was it? Or 10, 4 is where it said, um, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. 
so that term made perfect forever is talking about justification so legally we have already been made perfect when god sees us he sees the righteousness of christ we have been made perfect but we are still being sanctified that's the process that we are doing like that child we are grateful for the status that has been given to us and so we don't even have to feel under pressure anymore we don't have to work for towards that 100 the 100 is already received but now let us in our actions start behaving like people who have received 100 on 100 let's put in our very best of course in the, in, the, in, the, in this example the child because he has learning disabilities he will never become a person who can get 100 on 100 but we believers we can increase in our sanctification because the Holy Spirit is working with us. So li like we said, it's a supernatural work. The Holy Spirit is the one who will sanctify. But for that to happen, we have to walk by the Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. As we are led by Him, He starts sanctifying. If we choose not to be led by Him, then you know uh, we are wasting what has been given to us. And uh, so the reward that we would receive would be almost nothing. Because the reward would be based, right? In heaven, the rewards that we receive will be based on how, to what extent we chose to become Christ-like, in to what extent we chose to fulfill his purposes for our lives. So, uh, yes, so we are not completely sanctified as yet. Yeah. What? Working out. Uh, the Greek word for work out. Uh, where is it? Okay, K A T E R, then G, G A Z O, G A Z O, and then M A I. So, Kater Gazom Mai, okay, it's basically you producing something, creating something. And over here in this case, saying, you know, produce your salvation in the sense, produce the fruits of salvation. So continue to produce the fruits of salvation with what kind of an attitude? With fear and trembling. So um, uh, let's look at one more verse. Uh, you know, Second Timothy chapter one, verse verse seven. Second Timothy one seven. For Okay, so the spirit of God has not given us a fear, a spirit of fear. We have not been given a spirit of fear. Rather, we have been given a spirit, you know, who imparts to us power and love and self-discipline. So over here, when it says, produce the fruits of salvation with fear and trembling, it's not talking about that negative kind of fear. That would be a very, very wrong understanding of what it says over here. We have def most definitely not been given a spirit of fear or timidity so what is paul meaning when he uses this term over here when he says with fear and trembling is he saying all our days we're supposed to go on being scared and worried that we will lose our salvation no that's not what he is saying paul uses this particular phrase fear and trembling four times in the in his epistles um and in all the four places he's trying to bring out a different meaning Let's just look at one example, um, mainly uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. If someone could read out 1 Corinthians. Mm. Mm. Verse 4. Okay, he's talking about how he demonstrated the Spirit's power. So this was not a man who came there all scared and terrified and trembling in that sense. No, it's not talking about a spirit of fear and a spirit of timidity. That's not the kind of spirit that he received from the Lord Jesus. No, he is a man who is in fact demonstrating the Spirit's power. So what is it talking about over here? He says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified and then in verse uh, you know um, four he says um, my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words okay but with a demonstration of the spirit power 
he is saying i made a choice that i'm not not going to come to you and make those fancy you know nice sounding beautiful speeches you know which were very very popular in those times the greeks especially honored people who could stand in the front and make this beautiful sounding speeches you know where everyone would say wow the way he sounds amazing paul makes a resolution he decides i will not use any persuasive words or any fancy preaching i will only talk one thing i will talk about jesus christ and that too the crucified jesus christ is what i'm going to talk about and that would be like such a weak topic in the eyes of the greeks first of all the cross was something very humiliating for them in their eyes it was some it was something very pathetic and humiliating and he is saying i'm going to talk about my lord and master jesus christ i'm going to talk about him undergoing that that shameful humiliating process of crucifixion that's the only thing i'm going to talk about why because by doing that i'm going to demonstrate the power of the spirit so he is talking about how he came to them in weakness with great fear and trembling the term over there is talking about a sheer attitude of humility where he chooses not to be wise where he chooses not to show off his knowledge where he chooses not to give grand speeches he chooses to be humble enough to only talk about the crucified christ which in their eyes you know in the, in the eyes of the world be something very very silly but for those who are catching the power of what's being taught it would be the very power of god so over there the term fear and trembling is talking about an attitude of humility and we see the same thing in the other two places also where this particular term is used uh, did you raise your hand you didn't raise your hand thank you yeah so we will look at the other two references also just so that you know we can be very very clear that this is what he means by that particular term um second corinthians 7:15 Okay, so um, can't seem to remember who is it is being talked about in that uh, thing. In seven fifteen, is it talking about Timothy? Who is this person that they are receiving? Titus. 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 Titus yes, Titus. So Titus is being sent to them, and uh, so you know, rather than uh, you know ignoring what he is saying, you know they they are they are supposed to receive him with humility. listen to what he is offering them he is coming over there as a visiting leader who has been sent by paul so you know he says uh, you know when when you when titus comes to you receive him with a humble attitude so it's not saying that they, they should all be terrified of him that's definitely not what is being said over there so in the same thing again in ephesians 6:5 if someone can read out ephesians 6:5 ephesians 6:5 born servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ so here the slaves are being told you know have a humble attitude you know serve this master of yours you know this human flesh master of yours serve him as if you're serving Christ himself you know with sincerity of heart so again it's talking about the humble attitude so coming back to the original verse with which we started off this whole process philippians chapter 2 verse 12 continue to produce the fruits of salvation with all humility it takes humility to produce the fruits of salvation we don't feel like submitting to god we don't feel like you know uh, obeying his laws we don't feel like uh, giving up the things of the world but we choose to humble ourselves and produce the fruit of salvation on a daily basis um so there are two things especially that we need to you know that we choose to do uh you know how uh, two main things that we actually should be doing if we want to produce the fruits of salvation uh, first of course is romans chapter 12 um verse okay let's separate it romans chapter 12 verse 1 if someone can read out i wish is you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your responsible service so we are first of all asked to present ourselves as a living sacrifice in that context let us also look at romans chapter 8 verse 13 
Romans chapter 8 verse 13 for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live okay so here um it's saying how are you supposed to become a living sacrifice it's explained you choose to put to death on a daily basis the wrong things that your flesh is crying out for so by going on killing those things you know those desires of yours you are literally becoming a living sacrifice on a day-to-day -day basis so it says put to death the misdeeds of the body so every single day every time your uh, your your physical body as well as your uh, you know the the the, the sinful uh, uh, desires even as they go on you know uh, attracting you urging you to do sinful things you choose to put to death those things by doing that you are literally becoming a living sacrifice that of course is the first thing that we do in producing the fruit of salvation the second thing that we do of course is in your second verse 12, romans 12 uh, verse 2 romans 12 2 and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the first thing is we choose to be a living sacrifice on a daily basis. The second thing that we do is we constantly renew our mind. Only when you have a renewed mind will you get transformed. That's what it says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you don't renew your mind, you will never get transformed. So we need to re renew our minds. And as we start renewing our minds and start living as a living sacrifice, we make a discovery. We test and approve what God's will is. We discover that, oh, God's will is really good. It is pleasing. It is perfect. We, we, we practice, on a, uh, practice God's will on a daily basis and start discovering that indeed it is pleasing indeed it is good for us so uh, by renewing our mind and by being a living sacrifice we discover that god is indeed good and pleasing that what he wants for us is indeed beneficial that's the discovery which we make so roman 12 1 and 2 is what we would have to keep in mind uh, that is how we start producing the fruit of salvation on a daily basis and we, it takes humility to do that because we would have to humble ourselves. Um, so um, it, uh, yeah, they, you know, they, um, maybe we can read out Matthew chapter five, verse sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay, so over here it's talking about how we do good deeds and people who are watching us, they look at our lifestyle and they realize that our master is Jesus Christ and so they glorify him. So because of our good deeds, because of our righteous lifestyle, God's name is glorified. So we produce fruit in this sense, uh, in the sense that we are um, um, that we are doing works which are bringing honor and glory to God's name. Because people always ask, what does it mean by bearing fruit? You know, Jesus said, abide in me and you will bear fruit. Uh, so some people, they say fruit bearing basically is how many people, you know, you can bring to the Lord. That is basically the fruit. Uh, but... Uh, the thing is, none of us are able to, uh, you know, save anyone. So actually, we are not bearing the fruit. God is the one who bears that fruit. We only bring people to him and he brings them into the kingdom. So he makes them believers. Uh, so fruit bearing, when we say, uh, cannot be taken in the sense of, you know, apple tree produces apples. So believers produce believers. No, because we don't have the ability to produce a believer. All we can do is bring a person to the Lord, explain to them what the Lord is all about, what he has done. And then we leave it to the Lord Jesus to you know, convict him and uh, bring him into the family. So uh, we are believers, but we can't produce believers. All we can do is show them 
that this is the gospel message. This is what Jesus has done for you. And once we present them with this information, the Holy Spirit works inside them and produces a believer. So we literally, believers don't produce believers. But what can believers do? They can live in such a way, they can live such a lifestyle that people who are watching will say, my goodness, these people are full of light. They are reflecting the light of their God. And so they are attracted to this light and they too want to be part of this light. They too want to be part of this kingdom in which there is so much light. So they are drawn to God by the way we live. So um, the fruit of salvation would be literally the way we are living on a day-to-day -day basis. We are becoming living sacrifices and we are renewing our mind and we are discovering that God's will is indeed good and perfect. And then the people who are watching are convinced that this is something good. We also would like to have it. So in that sense, we are, uh, you know, we choose to bear fruit. Um, so can any person be completely sanctified while they are still on this earth? Um, now, that's a topic up for debate. Uh, but one thing we do know that Paul, being the amazing man that he was, even he did not reach, reach complete sanctification while he was on this earth because he, that's what he says about himself. Um, you know, mm, where does he say that? Yeah, Philippians, you know, is where he writes about that. Philippians 3, verse 12. <coughs> Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained or I am, I am already perfected, but I praise on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also lay hold of me. So he says very frankly, I have not yet been perfected. I have not yet arrived, but I'm pressing towards that. You know, just because I have not completely attained it yet, I'm not going to give up. No, I'm even though I have not yet achieved it. I am pressing forward towards it, is what he says. And that is why, you know, in 1 John 1, 8, where John is writing to these believers who have kind of gotten into a wrong doctrine, he tells them, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because they were going after this wrong teaching where someone was preaching and saying, ah, you know, you have now become believers, so now you are perfect people. Whatever you do, whatever on earth you do, it's not sinful. Because now you're incapable of sinning, which is not true. They, believers still can make a choice to sin. They can still fall into sin. So they should be careful and examine themselves on a daily basis. And if we see that something that we have done is sinful, we go to him and we humbly confess and say, Yes, Lord, what I have done is sinful. And then the Lord is you know, just and faithful in forgiving us. So can a person regard themselves as completely sanctified while they are on this earth? Most probably not. Okay, So uh, we would have to think of it in those terms. Well, we have eight minutes left. And let's see what we can you know, tuck into those eight minutes. Um, with regard to the law, you know, uh, so sanctification doesn't necessarily mean keeping the Mosaic law. Um, but Jesus seems to be saying that we should be fulfilling the law. So how do we understand that? Um, okay, let's go to those verses and see what. Galish. Okay, maybe we can read. John chapter 15. Uh, 10 to 12, if someone could read out. John 15, 10 to 12. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. The, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So you see, even believers have commandments which they are supposed to follow. So it's true that we were redeemed from under the law. We are no longer under the law, but we are under Christ. And Christ is having a commandment for us. What is the commandment that he gives over here? He says that we should love each other. Mm, so, greater, greater love has no one 
दिस इज माई कमांडमेंट दैट यू लव वन अनदर एज आई हैव लव यू ग्रेटर लव हैज नो वन देन दिस देन टू ले डाउन वन लाइफ फॉर हिज फ्रेंड्स so so we are called uh, to follow this commandment which god has given let's look at another verse galatians 6:2 go bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ okay so when you are bearing each other's burdens what are you actually doing you are fulfilling the law which christ has laid down so believers are also in the process of you know following the law but now this is the law of christ which they are following um let's also look at romans chapter 13 verses 8 to 10 romans 13 8 to 10 then oh no one anything except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments you shall not commit adultery you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not bear false witnesses you shall not covet and if there is any other commandment are all summed up in this thing namely you shall loves your neighbor as yourself love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law so there is one commandment which believers are again and again being told to follow and that is the law of love uh, because if we keep this commandment and we choose to live in an attitude of love towards one another then it says the entire law is all automatically fulfilled okay so uh, jesus you know in in his talks with the people when he was on this earth he brings out this point we don't have the time to go into those verses so we will not look at that but all along jesus made it very clear if you can keep this one commandment by the power of the holy spirit it's not something that we can do on our own then we will automatically be walking in sanctification because sanctification involves to a large extent living in love and this is what makes sanctification so difficult you know if it is just doing things for the lord the lord is so beautiful he's so wonderful we, we don't mind doing things for the lord oh but to live in love towards people People who have all kinds of attitudes, have all kinds of mood swings, and all kinds of uh, habits, and oh, to live in love towards them—that is where the fear and trembling comes in. You know that sheer humility. It says, "Work out your salvation with fear and trembling." And to use our, you know, uh, translation of that, produce the fruits of salvation with all humility. and in fact if you look at the context of that passage you know philippians uh, passage where it where he says that it's all talking about living in love putting other people's interests first in that context that wording is written produce the fruits of salvation with a humble attitude that's where that wording is used in that context so a large part of living a sanctified life is all about being christ like towards other people so you know if you're feeling really good about yourself about the amount of time that you're spending prayer you you, you know the amount of time that you meditate on scriptures the amount of time that you do in going out and doing ministry work all that is excellent but always remember that a large percentage of sanctification actually involves living in love and that is where true humility is required because when we look at philippians 2 we get to know that we are being asked to have the same mindset as christ who placed other people's interests first and that is where real christ likeness shows up so when we take you know when if we are doing a you know what is that evaluation sheets we get right i mean um, uh, how patient are you and then you 10 questions you have to tick 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 you know uh, so like that if we were you know doing an evaluation sheet and you know uh, uh, the the question over there is how christ like are you most of those questions will be dealing with loving one another so if we can tick mark those if one say yes i'm no i'm 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 doing good in these areas then you are genuinely christ like or you're somebody to be am- you know amazingly praised so because it's a very very difficult thing okay so it is something that can be done by the holy spirit because that's why it says he the may, may god himself you know the god of peace he will sanctify you through and through 
so it is possible it can be done we just have to choose to be humble if we are humble he will enable us to you know uh, live in that way all right so uh, yeah we are like out of time uh, so these wonderful students have no questions good we can finish the time okay yeah so let's just uh, close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for today and the lessons that we could learn um we truly want to live sanctified life so lord because we want to live worthy of the calling the high calling to which you have called us you set us apart and you called us a chosen generation you said my own special people is how you talked about us so that is the kind of calling to which you have called us so help us to actually live set apart lives not like the world but lord set apart from the world set apart exclusively for you to please you to honor you and lord even as it involves um, us having to live in love towards each other please lord you enable us to do that you start imparting a spirit of humility to us where we will be willing to have uh, the mindset of jesus christ where we will be willing to put the interests of others before our own uh, and lord i pray that you we will you will genuinely really help us a lot to become christ like in these areas of our lives lord we just commit ourselves into your hand this is a divine work that you alone can do in us and lord we look to you with with eager anticipation that you will indeed do your work in us thank you lord in jesus name amen Thank you so much.